the withdrawal of the spiritual seeker in the threefold life. Hello, this is Shores of Infinity, Chris speaking with a video about something we have discussed on the Facebook site recently and on the Patreon site, the withdrawal of the spiritual seeker. This is a transition period that is very, very common. And also Sri Aurobindo talks about it in the introduction to his synthesis of yoga. And I think he came up with a very good solution to the problem. You probably know it. Most of you probably know it, that at some point or another, or maybe right now, you tended or have started to withdraw from society, from life, from matter to some degree because it all seems so superficial and meaningless. By the way, don't forget to like and subscribe. This is always important for every channel. According to Sri and in the Vedas, there are three lives we live simultaneously. The material life, the mental life and the spiritual life. The material life is about self-preservation and inertia. The matter wants to stay as it is. And you can probably see this in society and human nature all around you. Most people want everything to stay the way it is. Don't rock the boat. It could get worse, so we rather keep it that way. This way. Please let us sleep. Or let us be distracted. Then there is the mental life, which is all about progress. And it is also the mental life which makes you seek something else, which makes you seek for the spiritual, which makes you seek for awakening and enlightenment and truth. You're not content with the way things are, you want more. And you know there is more somehow, somewhere. And then there's the spiritual life, which in the end is all about love. But the word love is so overused that most people don't understand what is meant with uh, spiritual love. It's not possible to understand it. It's understanding is part of the mental life. Love is only something you can feel. And to feel and experience universal love is very different than feeling desire love. It has nothing to do with preferring something or liking something or feeling attracted to it, or sexuality, is very different. It's more an acceptance and a joy of watching creation unfold and play. It is unconditional and doesn't have any preference. Even a piece of garbage on the floor appears lovable. And in the spiritual life, of course, we have the reunification with the divine that all spiritual seekers are longing for. So the mental life is the connection, is the glue between, or the bridge between the material life and the spiritual life. Everywhere in the world we have the material life, and the material life is the one we rebel against when we start our spiritual life journey in earnest. It becomes very difficult to connect to people, to talk to people, because they only want to talk about their distractions and their pains and their dramas, all those complaints and what they bought or would like to buy and the weather and their children and their diseases, and the war on the other side of the world, or the big tsunami, or whatever.
but rarely anything that seems deep and meaningful or even interesting. So for a while you probably start talking to intellectuals more and then you find out it's the same over there. They just want to wank off on their knowledge. There's nothing deep behind it. There's no longing for the deepest truth. In the West, it's all about success and fame and money. Also, those and in the West, there's a connection between the mental life and the material life. But both of them are geared towards fame. Very few scientists and inventors want to invent something for the betterment, for the benefit of the world. They want to invent it to earn money and fame and power. Power meaning political and economical influence to them. So to the spiritual seeker, there's no point in talking to any of these people. It's in the best case boring and in the worst case it's just torture. So he withdraws or she withdraws. In the East, it's changing now, but it used to be, especially in countries like India and Nepal and Bhutan and so on, it used to be a combination of the material life and the spiritual life. In the East, they didn't have the strong longing for progress and expansion for a long time. It's, it's changing now, in China, for example. But in India, there's still this very unique, or almost unique, combination of the material life on the one hand. Let's keep everything as it is, as long as it works somehow. And on the other hand, the spiritual life in the form of ashrams, monasteries, and sannyasins and sadhus roaming around. But here there's an unspoken pact. There's an unspoken pact to keep these two spheres more or less apart. They're visible to each other and they do influence each other, but they're more or less parallel. The spiritual people don't try to influence the material and political world and the material people and uh, the politicians and the economy don't try to influence the spiritual world. The politicians don't tell the gurus and the ashrams what to do. And the gurus and the ashrams don't tell the politicians what to do. With some exceptions, like Shurabindu, for example. He did very much uh, told the politicians what, politicians what to do. Part of that pact is also that the, the ashrams, that the spiritual part of society, don't do any advertisements. So they, they don't influence uh, politics, they don't organize any, any demonstrations and rallies. They don't do advertisements, please come to our ashram, um, that's a much better life. So this combination of material and spiritual life works because they leave each other mostly alone. Otherwise, they would threaten each other. There's a very good book by Neil Stevenson, Anathem. Anathem, like anathema. It's very difficult to read. It's, it's a novel, but it's very difficult to get into it because the first few chapters, you're wondering what the fuck he's talking about. But it's, it's about a society. It's about a world like our world where something like this happens. There's a material world on the one hand and there's the mental and spiritual world or life on the other hand in form in the form of very large ashrams where scientists and spiritual people work together and just explore. And there's a pact. There's a there's not an unspoken pact, it's a spoken and written pact that they leave each other alone. 
because the politicians, they don't want to mess with the scientists, because the scientists could easily whip up some extraordinary weapon. They can do whatever they want in their ashram university area. And in return, the scientists and spiritual seekers, they promise not to get involved in any material aspects, not in the economy or the politics or anything. They just stay within the ashram and that's it. Unless, unless there is a big catastrophe, which of course in this book happens and then they do have to work together to solve the global problem. This is very similar to how it used to be in India. And it is also quite similar to Dune, if you watch the new Dune movie or the old Dune movie or read or listened to the books, which are very good in my view, the best science fiction novels ever, because of their heavy spiritual content. They are the politicians in the form of the Landsrat and the, the Dukes and the Emperor and so on the one hand, and then they are the spiritual seekers and scientists on the other hand, in the form of the Space Guild, the Bene Gesserit, and the Bene Tlailaxu. But it's all kind of regulated. What the material life is afraid of is an unregulated spirituality. So this is why it gets suppressed so much. Material life is still kind of tolerated, as long as the scientists either stay in university and just talk to each other, or as long as they invent stuff that uh, can produce more income. In other words, as long as they are employees who can be controlled by the organs of the material life. Nowadays also, some spiritual gurus are accepted or even welcomed as long as they play the game as long as they don't comment on politics as long as they don't comment on global happenings like the plague the last two years or the war now or atrocities being committed to nature or to so-called primitive societies in South America, North America, Africa, Australia and so on. As long as they just talk some spiritual gibberish to a small number of lunatics, it's fine. And if someone like Russell Brand or J.P. Sears or Joe Rogan tries to do something else, they immediately get hit on the head. And then, of course, there are those who pretend to talk about the spiritual life or the mental life, but actually very much part of the material life, the success gurus, the speakers, the coaches. Because they say you can use mental and spiritual powers to achieve success and wealth, they are accepted. So what uh, scientists and especially spiritual gurus have tried to do under these circumstances is to introduce ideas of a higher order in a way that is understandable or somehow acceptable to the material masses. For example, the concept of evolution is a success, is a victory of the mental life over the or in the material life. Of course, it is being sold to us in a very crude and half wrong manner and form. But the principle of evolution is still is the, the main message of the mental life, that matter can change. So it has to be introduced 
into the material thinking and the material life the idea that matter can change, which is evolution. So a seed of something true is planted and even if it's misunderstood for centuries, at some point it will germinate and grow and blossom. The victory of the spiritual life over or in the material life are spiritual communities. But what often happens is they get infected with materialism and in the end they become some kind of money-oriented workshop centers. Or they become religious. That's the other thing. But it's still, it's still better to have religions than no spirituality at all. Religion is basically the lowest form of spirituality. It's the one that can be accepted again by the materially oriented masses. So the video is already quite long now, but I had to do this um, exploration here to come back full circle to the beginning. What is the spiritual seeker to do about this confrontation with matter and the material life? Should he or she withdraw or do something else? And if something else, then what? Trebindo says that the problem is that the kinds of spirituality that have been tolerated and allowed by the rest of society up till now have led to a major misunderstanding of what spirituality is. So the idols and images of spirituality that most people have in their minds and in their vision is a guru teaching a small select group of seekers. A private society, so to say, separated. That's where the terms like occultism and esoterics come from. Yeah, it's behind closed doors. It's hidden. Secret. The reason why they were hidden in secret, like uh, with the example of Sufis, for example, is because they, because they were afraid of being eradicated otherwise. The same goes for very unclear language. Most Christian mystics like Meister Eckert and so on, in the Middle Ages, they resorted to very unclear occult language in order not to get burned at the stake. In reality, in spiritual life, you don't need a guru. You, there are no secrets and you just have to look within. The problem is if you look within, then it's very hard to still be part of material life, which is focused only without. So withdrawal seems necessary. Either you participate in this outwards distraction or you go within, but then you need time and energy to withdraw. To, to really do it and most so many people then they withdraw in, into an ashram or just uh, save some money and take a sabbatical or something like this. Or in the old days of the Buddha in India you would just go into the forest or into the mountains. So don't forget that the bridge, the glue between the material and the spiritual is the mantle. The material Life just regards spirituality as loony, as crazy, as useless daydreaming or maybe art. The spiritual life regards the material life as a waste of time and energy because it's so superficial and doesn't lead anywhere except eternal procreation and inertia. Just history repeating itself again and again and again and also individual people repeating themselves again and again and again and again and again, blah, blah, blah. So they seem 
irreconcilable and incompatible. And the key is in the mental life. The key is to have a science that allows material, mental and spiritual aspects and brings them together and explains them. To explain that all three life forms are natural and necessary, matter is the basis, spiritual is that which is eternal, the beginning and the end of all things, and the mind is the link between the two. All nature, he writes, is an attempt at a progressive revelation of the concealed truth a more and more successful reproduction of the divine image. This is why science is so important. Real science. Most science is mainstream science, in spirodynamics terms, blue, and thus it's, it's not real science, it's just, again, part of matter, part of inertia. But those scientists really want to get to the bottom of the things, to the root, to the core, they are very important, even if they're wrong and misunderstood at first. But what does science mean? Science means you can do an experiment and then you have a certain outcome. And then if you do this experiment again to show someone else, it will work more or less the same way and you have more or less the same outcome. So it must be verifiable and repeatable and explainable. So when Galileo Galilei dropped things from a height and saw that they fall down always, they fall down again and again and again, the same thing happens, he was able to formulate some kind of physical law. But science doesn't mean everything has to be physics and chemistry and mathematics. Science is just a tool. A tool how to get to verifiable, repeatable results that work, that are useful. And that is why yoga is a science. Yoga is not just stretching and breathing. Yoga is the science of how to achieve the reunification with the divine, how to achieve the reunification of the material, mental and spiritual life. It has been tried and tested, verified, repeated for dozens of generations, maybe hundreds of generations, for centuries and millennia. It works. And yoga is about what is the human being, what is the world, what is nature, what is the mind, what is spirit, what is the divine. All those questions have been answered already. There's no need to reinvent the wheel or to look for new methods that have been invented by some idiot five or ten years ago and are hyped now and sold for a lot of gold. It's all there and it's not secret and it's available to everyone and anyone. And the thing that the ancient yogis of the Vedas and Upanishads found out, and the thing that the first Buddha found out, and the thing that uh, Shrobindo and Meyababa rediscovered in those texts is something I've been harping on a lot in the last videos. Sorry for the repetition, but it's important to understand. Enlightenment or spiritual freedom or whatever you want to call it is not about you as an individual. The trick how and why enlightenment works is that it's about humanity as a whole, about this whole planet Earth as a whole. It's not about your freedom. 
If you're thinking about your freedom, you have misunderstood something and you're running away from something. You're running away from matter, but matter is part of the world. It's about the transforming, the transformation of matter towards the spirit, from whence it came and from whence it originated. Osho always used to tease his students, but how to get out of it? It's, that's not the question, that was just the tease. You can't get out of it. It's not about getting out of it. It's not about escaping. It's about what the Buddhists call the Bodhisattva. To work for the whole of humanity, for the freedom of humanity as a whole, for the whole species to be free. Neither nature nor spirit will support your endeavor of single individual enlightenment. No one up there wants that. The doors of heaven only open to those who are selfless, who work for the benefit of everyone which is called Karma Yoga in India. And charity in Christianity. Love thy neighbor as thou lovest yourself. Or brotherhood and sisterhood in other religions. It's all about community. And this is also important for the spell dynamics colors, which are more community oriented, like green and turquoise and teal and whatever you want to call the last color of the second tier. It's about realizing that you cannot and are not supposed to make it by yourself on your own. There are periods where you may withdraw for a while and work only for yourself for a while, but then you have to think about the others as well. So use your mind scientifically and communally. And this will be the bridge between matter and spirit. And please don't try to reinvent the wheel. It's there already, plain as daylight. There are no secrets. The only thing you have to do is to surrender and give up the idea that you are a person who will someday become enlightened. Your personality will never become enlightened. It's impossible to have to give up your personality and realize that you're part of a whole. And this will give you the power the real power to get out of the periods of withdrawals and do something useful. My way of doing something useful, for example, is to do these videos. At least I hope they're useful and people tell me they're useful. <laughs> so if you liked it, please like and subscribe. Please join me on Patreon. Thank you to all Patreons. Thank you for sharing the videos with your friends and see you soon.